you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be reading from uh, Mark, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Beginning in verse 17. The reason is as such, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have done since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed. And they said to each other, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at him and he said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. I love buffets. You can probably tell that I love buffets. Blaine and I live in Galesburg. We live on Fremont Street, which is the street that the high school is on, and if you go on down to the east side. Um, We live down there about a couple of minutes from every restaurant in Galesburg. And since we haven't had children in our house for almost 20 years, um, we use those restaurants a lot. But I have found that we hardly ever go to eat in a restaurant where it's menu only order. We go to the buffets because you get your money's worth at the buffet. It's all you want, all you can eat, and you get to eat the things that you like, and you get to pass up the things that you don't like. For example, I hate lima beans. I don't know why God ever created lima beans. (laughs) And I can remember as a child, mom saying we have to eat our lima beans. And I can remember pulling them off the plate and putting them in my pocket So it appeared as though I ate my lima beans. But buffets and salad bars and smorgasbords are so American, aren't they? They're all about our choices and doing and eating and the things that we like and the things that satisfy our appetites. We Americans, we're kind of like that. We like our appetites to be satisfied. But sometimes we can take that and apply it to the things of God. Sometimes we may make the mistake of of choosing just to listen to the things that we like or that appeal to our own spiritual appetite. You know, as you look at the Word of God, there are several aspects of it. And when you study it, and when you rightly divide the Word of Truth, there are things that are doctrinal. And over the last few months, uh, as I've been here and had the honor to share from this stage. I must tell you, I have a real appetite for the doctrinal things of the Bible. 
the things that we believe, the core beliefs that are placed within us. And the reason that I do is because I believe with all my heart that our core values and our core beliefs drive us in everything we do. That the things that you do in life are because somewhere inside of you there's a core belief, a doctrine, a dogma that drives it. And whether you do it consciously or subconsciously, you may not know. And so I love to teach about the doctrine of the church and the doctrines of the scripture. But sometimes you, you just got to knuckle down and eat those lima beans. And today, the scripture that I just read doesn't contain uh, a great deal of doctrinal things. It has more of a relational message to it. And so along with doctrinal things, we need to also study the Bible devotionally. In other words, we need to look at the scriptures and say, how is it actually speaking to me? How is it speaking into my life? And what am I supposed to do with that? And then the other way that we should know that the Bible works and that we should look at it is inspirationally. The inspiration of the Bible comes from God. The Bible says of itself, it is God-breathed. It is God-inspired. It is breathed into us. And that's the power of God as he works through the living active word. But the devotional part of it is, is, so what do I do with that? What do I devote myself to? In loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, how do I love him with my strength, my actions? And what should I devote myself to? And the text that we read here this morning is the words of Jesus. It's what we would call red letter gospel. And the concern that I have about the church of today and the church in America is that we may have become a buffet church. We may have, it may have become like going to the salad bar and we pick the things that we want to hear. In 2 Corinthians, Paul, in the 11th chapter, Paul warns a church just 25 years after the resurrection to beware of false Christs, to beware of false gospels and false spirits. He says to be vigilant and to be careful. And if that were true 25 years or 20 years after the resurrection, how much more true do you think it is today, 2,000 years later, as we examine what the Scripture is teaching us? Not just the things that we want to hear, but the things that we need to hear. Not just the things that we want to satisfy our appetites, but the things that we need to nourish our spiritual lives. And so in this gospel story of Jesus and this rich young ruler, I want, to, I want us to look at it this morning. I want us to just kind of walk through it verse by verse and see if it has anything to say to you and me today devotionally. So at some point, it's not going to be about me. It's not going to be about me teaching doctrine. It's going to be about you receiving what Christ is saying in this text. Jesus is passing through Judea. He's actually on his way to Jerusalem uh, for his triumphal entry and, and, of course, for the time that we would call Easter that we celebrated last week. And Jesus, as he's passing by, we read there in verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus was very popular. And he was popular among a certain type of people. He was popular among the poor. He was popular among those who needed food and those who needed healing and those who needed deliverance as he taught and as he healed and as he fed them. But there was a group of people that he wasn't popular with, and they were the religious leaders, and they were the rich people and the people that had the power and they had control. And this instance that we're reading about this morning is a rare strange instance because the scriptures tell us in, in Mark and also in Matthew and also in Luke and all the synoptic gospels, it tells us the same story. How this rich young ruler, Matthew calls him rich, uh, Luke calls him a ruler, and I think all of them call him young. He came, to me, he came to Jesus, he ran to him and fell on his knees before him. Now, this is interesting because culturally, that would have never happened. Culturally, in the time that Jesus lived, the, the rich 
and the powerful did not run toward anybody. They were the ones that would summon. If I were rich and I wanted, you know, Nicodemus, I'll summon Jesus to come and meet with me, and he'll come. So this actually begins very strangely. This rich young man, he runs and he throws himself down at the feet of, or on his knees before Jesus, and he says, good teacher. And then he asks this, this, what we used to call the $64,000 question. What must I do to get eternal life? What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus begins this teaching as he shares with, with this young man. And the first thing he says is, why do you call me good? You ever met anyone that thinks they're going to go to heaven because they're good? Yeah. You know why they think they're going to go to heaven because they're good? See, good is a comparative word. It doesn't mean anything unless you're comparing two things. You know, if that was a good meal, then good compared to what? Well, it didn't have lima beans in it. Um, (laughs) But that's what made it good, better than the the other meal, perhaps. (laughs) So it's a comparative word, and the reason that people think they're going to go to heaven because they're good is because they're comparing themselves to you and me. You see, there's a part of life that we live on a horizontal plane. That's us. We walk this, we walk this path, this earth together. But then there's also a vertical part of life. And people who have the notion that somehow they're good enough are probably people that would, you know, compare themselves to Sam. And compared to Sam, everybody's going to heaven, Right? And Sam would say, well, compared to you, everybody's going to go to heaven. And thus is true. Compared to me and Sam or anyone else in here, anybody could go to heaven on their goodness. But Jesus makes it very clear. He says, why do you call me good? This is Jesus Christ speaking. There's none good but God. So if you want to get to heaven on your merit or on how good you get, how good you are, here's the comparison. You, God. Me, God. So Jesus makes a very strong point and a misconception that this young man has. He's using a word that does not apply when you look at the eternal comparison who is God. Now I want to I contend this morning that this young man, unlike I've heard sermons on this, and you've all heard sermons on this, but I've heard sermons that contended that this young man was... Um, a spoiled, haughty, know-it-all Pharisee, proud of his own righteousness. I don't think that's true. I think he became very sincere. He was very open, and he made himself vulnerable by running. He made himself vulnerable by kneeling down at Jesus' feet and by calling him good. Instead, I would compare him more to a disillusioned church kid who knew all the right answers and had done all the right things, but yet he still did not be fulfilled. He did, still did not, he knew something was missing in his life amongst all his good works. And that first response, when Jesus talks to him, he talks to him about law. Interesting thing about when you're reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels are a transition period. They're a transition period from the Old Covenant into the New Covenant. The New Covenant doesn't come until the book of Acts. So we see Jesus many times saying things that, well, that doesn't really fit with what we believe today. He's being a little legalistic. He's being a little uh, too much about the law. But we must understand that Jesus is making a, a grand and great transition here. So as he teaches, he begins to teach this young man about the law. Why? Because he's willing to meet him where he is. See, there's a a false doctrine in some of modern Christianity, and it goes something like this. Jesus accepts you for who you are. That's a lie. Jesus accepts you. He accepts me for who I am. No, he accepts you where you are. He has no intention of leaving you there. He has no intention of walking away and leaving you unchanged. He will come to where you are because my philosophy of life is you are where you are. You can't change that. You have to operate. You have to go forward from where you are. 
You could wish you were someplace else and you could go from there, but you can't. Reality says you are where you are. And so this young man was in the Jewish culture, influential, rich, and governed by the law. So Jesus approaches him where he is, but he has no intention of leaving him there. Does that make sense? This gospel of Jesus accepts me how I, how I am is, is paramount to saying that Jesus is okay with sin. If Jesus accepts you where you are, you don't need him. You're okay. No, he comes to where we are so that he can take us away from the place, places that we are. And he will not leave us there. So he comes to the, this young man, and this young man is, is um, well, let's just see what it says. Why do you call me good, Jesus said. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, do not honor your father and your mother. And he replies, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. And you know the astonishing thing after that, Jesus doesn't say, oh, no, you didn't. He should have, he could have, but he didn't. He didn't. Why? Because it was a profound thing that Jesus wanted to teach here, I believe. Have you ever, you ever taken the Ten Commandment test? It's very simple. You start at the beginning, and you look at if you've ever broken one of them. And Jesus could have done it. He could have stopped and had an argument with this. He could have said, okay, let's go through the commandments. You shall have no other God before me. Have you ever put anything in front of God? Ever. Guilty? You lose. You ever taken the name of the Lord in vain? Guilty? You ever dishonored your father and your mother? Oh, yeah, guilty. Lima beans. You ever stolen from someone? Yeah. You ever lied to someone? You ever wanted somebody else's stuff? You say, well, I haven't killed anybody. You ever wanted anybody dead? You see, the truth is we've broken all of them. And Jesus could have proven very easily that this young man had broken all of them too, but that wasn't the point. He wanted to show him something else about himself. And so he goes on, and I love, this is the key verse in all this text. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. There are two things that Jesus does better than he does anything else. He looks at you. The Bible says that he knew the hearts of men. He could read the hearts of men. And then he loves you in spite of looking at you. So Jesus looks at him and he loves him. And then Jesus should have said, let's pray the sinner's prayer. Let's kneel, let's kneel together, pray the sinner's prayer. Let me take you to the baptistry and we'll baptize you. And you'll be a Christian. Shouldn't he have said that? But he doesn't. In fact, it's really weird what he says. He says, oh, by the way, one thing you lack Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. You say, wait a minute, Dan, that sounds a lot like works. That sounds a lot like law. What's up with Jesus? Doesn't he know, doesn't he know how we evangelize around here? Why would he say that? Why would he heap one more thing on this kid? Because he looked at him. And he loved him. And he was unwilling to let this young man walk away without knowing the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And then one of the saddest verses in the scripture, at this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. It's amazing how we define ourselves. 
Now, I don't know about you ladies, because you're different than us guys, but here's how guys define themselves. If I meet a guy I've never known, and I'm having a conversation with him, sooner or later, probably sooner than later, this question comes up. So uh, what do you do? What is it you do? Because guys define themselves on what they do and how strong they are and how fast they are and whether they judge each other to be losers or winners. Guys, am I right? Sure, it, go, it, it goes to that. It's, it's somehow our nature. I'm not saying it's bad necessarily. I'm just saying that's how we do it. I don't know about you ladies, how you define yourselves, you know. How do you feel? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. It's not what do you do. It's like, how do you feel? Uh, I can't answer that one. I just know about the guys, and I know it's so true. That the prowess that we put, or, the, or the, even the worth that we put sometimes in our lives is based on our vocation. Whether we went to college, or whether we have a degree, or whether we're doctors or lawyers or or whatever. And I'm guessing, and I don't have to guess, that this young man did the same thing, only his was about his money. His was about looking for purpose, value, and security in the things that he had. You know, Jesus said you will serve one of two gods in this world, and he didn't say the Lord God and the devil. He said, you will serve one of two gods in this world, either God or mammon. And mammon means that the material things of this world, whether it's money or land or houses or or property, that's the God that Jesus warned his people about in life. And it's interesting because if that's the way we define ourselves, then there's something deeper than keeping, even keeping rules and regulations. I kept them since, my, since I was a boy. I've kept all the commandments. I'm a good boy. I'm a good boy. That doesn't define you. You can't let that define you. I think that's what Jesus was saying. And look at this. Look at the, the response of his disciples. He said, it's really hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were amazed. It's hard to do it, he said. It's easier for the camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? There are three theories about what that sentence means when Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. One theory is this, that in the city of Jerusalem, it was a walled city and there were gates. There were many gates to the city and some were large for caravans to go through and some were smaller that only a a person could walk through, basically. Night gates. And that one of those gates was called the Eye of the Needle. And in order for a camel to get through the Eye of the Needle, the gate, you'd have to take everything off of it, strip it down. It would have to get down down on its knees and bow its head and kind of inch its way through this Eye of the Needle. And that kind of makes sense, right? you got to humble yourself before God in order to crawl into his kingdom and his salvation. Second theory is this, that, they made a, that there was a, a clerical error in the, in the writing of the Gospels, and the word for camel is spelled just like the word for cable, except there's an E in one and an I in another. And so there was a clerical error made, and it should have said it's easier for a cable or a rope to go through the eye of a needle And now we're kind of within the realm of possibilities. Um, And then the last theory is that Jesus is speaking in hyperbole. He's using a colloquialism that's often used uh, by the Jews at that time. Now, because I think it's interesting, I want to talk about these. The first one, the eye of the needle being the gate, that, that one sounds really cool. It sounds like it'd make a great sermon. The problem is it doesn't exist. That through research, it's a story that has grown up. It's like an urban legend, only like a Bible legend. There's never been a gate that they called the eye of the needle for a camel to inch its way through. 
Because that would actually say that it's, you're, it's capable for someone to work themselves into heaven. Just strip yourself down, humble yourself, and then just inch your way into heaven. The second theory about the cable doesn't make sense because all three Gospels say camel. So, yeah, so three different authors would have to make the same mistake in spelling. The third one is, is probably, 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 probably the truth. The truth. Jesus, Jesus is speaking in the language of rabbinical language. In fact, in fact uh, the, a camel going through the eye of a needle is found in other rabbinical writings of the time. And there's an ancient writing from Persia that says, talks about an elephant going through the eye. What it means, and actually Jesus explains it in the text, he says, with man, this is impossible. What does it mean for how easy is it for a rich man to get into heaven? It's impossible. <laughs> In the Greek, the Greek word means impossible. It's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. Well, let's think about that for a second. Job was rich. I wonder if he went to heaven. Abraham was filthy rich. I wonder if he went to heaven. Isaac. Joseph was the prime minister of Egypt. Do you wonder if he's in heaven? Um, David was king. Daniel was the prime minister of uh, Babylon. Rich men who we really do believe made it to heaven, right? So what, what's going on here? <laughs> what are we talking about here? It'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, and his disciples were astonished even more. Here was the belief in the day of the disciples that if you had money, if you had wealth, if you had power, if you had health, you were under the blessing of God. That if you were sick or poor or destitute, you were under a curse. We know this from other texts in the, in the Gospels where Jesus comes upon a man who's crippled from birth and his di disciples say to him, who sinned, his mother or his father? Who put this curse on this man? And Jesus' reply in that instance was, nobody, this was done for the glory of God. This man was made like this for this day because I'm going to show you the glory of God right now in him. So that theory doesn't work. The problem is that theory has come down through the ages. It's come down to us in the way, there again, that we define who we are. And I think in essence, Jesus is talking about who this young man is really should be, could be, and at the time is. Jesus says it's impossible. It's impossible for a rich man to enter heaven. But you know what? It's impossible for a poor man to enter heaven too, in and of himself. Because when Jesus said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, he said one more sentence. He said, then Come, follow me. That's your ticket to heaven. The ticket to heaven is following Jesus. The ticket to heaven is knowing that he is the Lord and that he looks into us. He knows what you need when you don't know what you need. He knows what you should pray for when you don't know what to pray for. And he loves you to the degree that he'll give you the truth. So what's the point, Dan? Get to the point. I hope you know it by now. The point is this, that as we live our lives, it's very easy to let things come between us and Christ. And when they do, it keeps us from following him. And I want to tell you something about your salvation. Your salvation is a journey. We talk about next steps here. And it's very true. My salvation lies in the fact that I'm walking with Jesus. I'm not just looking at him. I'm not just asking him the important questions. But I'm actually listening as he looks at me and as he loves me and as he leads me. And so step by step, we go together as we 
come after him and as we follow him. That's where salvation lies. And that's what he was saying to this young man. But tragically, tragically, his response was he had a great deal of riches. He had something. Jesus tells a parable of, it's called the parable of the sower. And he talks about four types of soil on which the seed, which is the word of God, falls. He says there's one type where people receive the word gladly. But as they go through life, as they start down this trail, that there are some things that rise up and steal that seed. And they are the cares of this world. Do you know about the cares of this world? Don't we all know about the cares of this world and the responsibilities that we have? He says the cares of this world, the lust of the eye, longing for pleasure, longing for entertainment, longing to be satisfied some way. And then finally he says, the deceitfulness of riches. You see, if the young man sells everything he has, gives it to the poor, that doesn't save him. But it may hinder him if he doesn't. It may be that one thing that traps him and keeps him from knowing the fullness of Christ in his life. And so devotionally this morning, between you and God, it's not about me, I've got my own between me and God. The question is this, is there something? You say, well, I'm not rich. Did you know that you live as an American and if you can pay your rent and live in a house that you're in about the top five or six percent of all the people on earth? And that there are eight guys, it's, it's, it's reported that there are eight men who are so rich that they control half the wealth of the earth. If you took them out of the picture, all of us would, would lie in the top 1% of the richest people on earth. So we can't say I'm not rich in earthly things. We stand here just like this young man with Jesus looking inside of us and loving us enough to say, you got to get rid of this. Don't let this be the thing that hinders you. Don't let this be the thing that keeps you from being all that you can be in Christ. I'm not a gambler. I've never played the lottery. Um, when I was at the fire department, we, put, we played nickel, dime, pitch. And that's the closest I've ever come to, to gambling, I think. Sometimes it got really crazy and we do quarters, Okay. That was just about, just about my life. I'm not a gambler. But I was fascinated a few years ago with watching the World Series of Poker. You ever watch that? It's the tournament. It's, now it's like multiple, multiple millions of dollars at the end of this tournament. So hundreds of gamblers are there sitting at these tables playing Texas Hold'em. And I watch these people, and some of them, it doesn't even seem like they're gambling. They're so good at this game. They, they, they're so proficient at it. But one thing I discovered of the person that wins the entire thing, at some point, and sometimes at many points, he's got to go, I'm all in. I'm risking everything. I'm giving it all. I'm selling out. I remember when I was a teenager in youth group, there was a phrase that was always thrown about our church. I probably didn't know what it meant then, um, but I don't hear it anymore in church. It's the phrase, are you sold out? Are you sold out to Jesus? You ever, anybody ever hear that? Yeah, when you, at least when you were younger in the, in the 60s and 70s. But that's the question. Are you sold out? Or is there one thing that you would say, I can't part with this? I can't give it up. Jesus ends that text that we read with some very encouraging words, I think. He says, for anyone who gives up houses, homes, brothers, sisters, fathers, he's not talking about money now. He's talking about some really important stuff for the sake of the gospel, who loses it for the sake of the gospel that I will repay you, and it's an incredible promise, a hundredfold in this life, 
and then the life to come, eternal life. Last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we had the joy of being in someone's home that we deeply love and appreciate and had a meal there. And there was a young man that had a meal with us. And I'm not going to say his name to embarrass him. He's here today. <laughs> Who's sharing his story with me. He's not from around here. And he said that if his parents knew that he was a Christian, they would disown him immediately. And that his family would begin to persecute them for having raised a Christian unbeknownst to them. But I would love for him to know, and I hope, he's, hope you're listening, that if those are the things you lose, that there's a hundred families. There are millions of brothers and sisters waiting to embrace you because that's the promise of Christ. You'll never give up something that belongs to this world that you won't gain something that belongs to forever. If you really trusted someone and he said to you, you give me a dollar and I'll give you a billion back, would you do it? So what's Jesus saying? He says, you give me your life and I'll give you a million lifetimes. Is there anything that's separate? I can't answer that for you. I can only answer it for me. But today is about devotion. How devoted are we to Christ? We're going to partake in communion, which we do every week. And the hard thing about taking communion every week is that it's so easy for it just to become something that we do. But in Paul's teachings about communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says that a man ought to examine himself. That does not mean that you, you know, you say, I'm not worthy of communion. We take communion because we're not worthy, right? Not because we're worthy. We take it because of the great gift of God through his blood and through his body. But it says that we should examine ourselves. And this morning, I want you to examine yourself in that light. And ask your own heart, is there something that I wouldn't trade for Jesus? Is there something that I can't feel all in? But I'm saying, go all in anyway. It will be worth it because of the promise of Christ that in this life, He will replace all of those things. I've never seen the righteous for certain, but His seed may be read it. The Bible says, in the life to come, eternal life. I'm going to pray. You guys are going to come back. The communion tables will be open. Maybe no one takes communion. I can't answer that. I can only say it's that. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you. Thank you that you look deep inside of us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you give us truth. For we know that truth sets us free. And we know that we want to be defined by being loved by you, by being valued by God. It gives us all of the definition that we need. It gives us more worth than we are worth. But that comes because you love us. And so, Fathers, we worship you now, remembering, remembering how you proved love. You gave your life and laid it down. Well, Jesus, you said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. And greater love hath no man than that he lay down his life for his friends. You have called us your friends. So we look into our own hearts this morning. There again, we're not worthy. We're never worthy to take this communion. We take it because we're unworthy and we recognize that. But God, as we examine our hearts, Give us the courage, give us the strength, give us the power of the Spirit in our lives to say, I'm going all in. I'm going to risk it all for the payoff that I know is there. And I thank you for it. It's a promise.
product of your love. We give you praise in Jesus' name.